I'm always really pleased to uh, do a lecture for this um, free recovery series. I'd like to do one about once a year. I think this is the fourth one I did. I did um, I've done one on adoption that uh, was alluded to a couple of times. Um, and because that's, an, that's something that that's really fascinates me because adoptees are, are very overrepresented in the um, in, in, in treatment um, environments and in the recovery movement. Um, there was a lecture on the um, couple relationship and one on codependency, I think, last year. Um, and they are up on sort of YouTube if you're interested. I don't put them up there. But, um, <laughs> I think, as this is about under-earning, I need to big, my, big myself up oh. and, uh, and have some sort of esteem. And I'll now attempt to introduce myself <laughs> and tell you that um, I, I, I'm, a, a, I'm an addiction psychotherapist. Um, I'm a, a trainer and a, a consultant. I trained just under 30 years ago, actually. Um, never believe it, but um, I think 30 years ago as an addictions counsellor. Um, so that was in, in, in the 80s and in the 90s as, um, as a psychotherapist. Um, I've worked in uh, the primary treatment environment for a long time. I worked at Cloud's House, um, which some of you will know for I don't know, I think about 16 years. Um, and I was head of treatment there. And I then also worked at Crossroad Centre in Antigua as the clinical director, working with um, uh, a larger American team. So I've had quite a sort of an interesting time, and I came into the addictions field at a time that was quite interesting because it was just starting to get professionalised. Actually, Cloud's House, I think, is maybe about 30 years old. It was the second 12-step treatment centre to start in the UK. Broadway Lodge was probably the first one you may have heard about. And the staff, very typically at, um, in those treatment centres in the early days, were people who were in recovery. And, and, and treatment was very much a 12-step uh, facilitation treatment. Um, and there were doctors and nurses, but there was no real space for psychologists or psychotherapists, and no real space to think really about addiction as being anything other than about alcohol and drugs. And in fact, when Broadway Lodge started up, it was for um, you know, alcohol dependence. And they, they had an experiment in the early 80s where they thought they would, they would allow a few dis potentially disruptive addicts to join the program, <laughs> no more than four at a time. I think they thought they'd all sleep with each other, which they did. But actually, they also um, they also got well. But it was it, it was quite an exciting time for me training them because it was also people like Pierre Melody were starting to write about codependency. Um, some of these other fellowships were starting to take off, as you know. You know what started in you know in the thirties with um, Alcoholics Anonymous is now you know there's over fifty different self help groups, you know, all using the twelve step recovery programs. And, and people were just starting to get quite sort of it, quite excited. So um, that's sort of me. I now work. Um, I, I spend half of my time doing addiction psychotherapy, and the other half of, of my time helping people set up treatment centres um, really uh, uh, around the world. I'm a bit of an anorak. I'm fascinated in recovery, mm -hmm. um, but I'm also very interested in what happens to people during the course of recovery. I mean, I think it's fascinating that people, you know, people get well. But we know so much now that we didn't know before. Mm -hmm. um, and, and certainly in terms of what we know is that people, people in recovery actually have to face many recoveries you know, in the course of a lifetime. It's not just, you know, it's not just one. Um, and there isn't one fix. There are layers, like the layers of the onion, that people have to look at. And I think that's fascinating. I'm also fascinated in, by what happens to people at different points in the, in the life cycle, too, actually. Because one in three of us can expect to get depressed at some point in our lives. And actually, having a recovery program doesn't, act, doesn't necessarily stop that. We're all going to have difficulties at different points in the, in the life cycle. We're all going to have a bit of a midlife crisis. You know, it's just going gonna, gonna to happen. So I'm fascinated by that, and I'm fascinated because I tra I've trained as a psychotherapist at, um, at the Department of Psychiatry at, um, at Guy's Hospital. I'm also really interested in, in other aspects of, um, of, of personality and, tr and treatment. And I guess particularly I'm interested in, in what we call systemic thinking, because the addiction movement is very much about, and quite rightly, it's about taking personal responsibility for self. Victims don't recover, we all know that. If you want to get well, you take personal responsibility. But actually, we also know that people in recovery exist within a, within a system. And we know that actually family systems also influence um, people's personality. 
so that actually very often the addict, for example, not only is managing their own distress, but is also doing something on behalf of the family. And so very often, and you probably know this, that actually when the addict, whatever the addiction is, starts to get well, very often something else comes up in the family system and something else you know, shows itself. Um, I'm also very interested systemically in the couple relationship because actually what we know now is there's never just one addict in a couple relationship. It can, always, it can often look like there's only one, but very often uh, the couple does this unconscious sort of dynamic whereby one person wears their distress on the sleeve as the acting out addict, and the other's distress is maybe tucked up their sleeve. And I'll talk a bit about that with the sort of financial addictions. Now, um, anyway, that was a bit of a, an introduction, and somewhere else I went, and that's, that's what happens. Um, I don't use a PowerPoint for these talks. I do if I'm giving, if I'm talking, um, doing some sort of academic talk, because actually, I mean, addiction is about sort of connection and, or, or loss of connection, and recovery is certainly about intimacy. And I, actually, I sort of feel if you've got a PowerPoint, you're not going to quite know what's going on. The, I, I think the bad news for me is that without PowerPoint, it means I do have to keep looking at my notes, and that might um, be a bit dis disruptive for you. But I, I, hope, I hope that's okay. There's going to be room for some questions and, and complaints at the end. Of <laughs> So um, let's get stuck in. This is called Money Matters in Recovery, a look at, a look at spending, debting, and under-earning. I'm quite repetitive, so if you're taking notes, don't worry too much, because I'm likely to say the same thing several times. Um, I mean, you know, money doesn't get talked about. We know that. You know, If I asked one of you to stand up and tell us how much you earned, um, I don't think you'd be very keen to do that. If I asked one of you to stand up and tell, them, tell me how much you were in debt, you wouldn't be very keen to do it. If you were in a recovery program, I suspect, for your financial addictions, you might be able to do that because you would know that facing that and having that clarity was really important. But, you know, let's face it, we don't like to talk about it. We'd probably rather talk about our favourite sex position than we would about how much we own or how much we own. I don't know, it's a close one, I should think. But um, it's not talked about much. It's also not talked about much professionally. Um, the UK has a symposium on addictive disorders. It's a three-day symposium. It's been going probably for maybe the last 15 years. This year was the first year that they actually had a talk on, um, on money, which got mixed up with sort of money and work. And I've been honoured them. I was a trustee for the Addiction Recovery Foundation that puts on this United Kingdom and, and European um, Symposium on Addictive Disorders. I've been mean, honoured for ages to take this seriously. And um, so they put this on the agenda. Actually, they put it on the agenda at the end of day three, so the 4.30 sort of slot on the end of day three, where people were starting to pack up and go home. There were three other, uh, three other options. Anyway, I went along to support this, having gone on about it for ages to them. There was four of us there. <laughs> four people. You'd sort of think that this would be big. This actually is the smallest audience I've spoken to here. You'd think that this would be bigger. You would think that Debtors Anonymous would be the fastest growing fellowship, wouldn't you? It's absolutely not. You know, so there's something about money. You know, there's a shame, there's a stigma, there's something there that we just don't want to look at. It. So I certainly thank you guys for coming along. So, Because I feel really passionate about this. I think it's really important that we put it on the agenda. Because um, it's also, money isn't talked about in, um, in addictions training. It's just starting to be. In the States, there's a training called the Certified Multi-Addictions Therapist Training, CMAT. And um, that's just starting. It was started by the people that started, the Patrick Carnes and his outfit that do the sex addiction training. And they're doing this sort of multi-addiction training. But, you know, the last module to be written on this multi-addictions training was the money module. And they've slightly skipped, I think, to, to be honest with you. Um, but, you know, that's the only, the only thing. If you do counselling or, or psychotherapy training, you don't talk about money. I wonder how many people in primary treatment will sit down when they're doing a psychosocial history and say, how much do you earn? And what debts do you have? I think some will. But I think it really gets avoided. Credit counselling, perhaps, but you know, credit counselling doesn't talk about the psychological processes. Credit counselling is about, let's see how much money you need, where does your money go, so there's an attempt to get some clarity. But it's very much about consolidation, isn't it? It sort of misses the fact that there might be something sort of psych psychological. 
So there's little, um, and, and also, of course, it's not taught in schools. The three things that I think are the most important things in life aren't taught in school. How to have a relationship, a complete minefield. How to bring up a child, a complete minefield. But the children act like they've got personality disorders when they're in their teens anyway. You know, and how to manage money. None of that is taught. There's the guy, I don't know, um, I don't know his full name, but he has a website, um, is it Martin's Money Tips? She's mm-hmm. the guy on Radio 4. Mm-hmm. Do you know his full mm-hmm. name? Martin Lewis. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I think he's great. He's mm-hmm. such a great guy. And um, he, I mean, he, he posts every day on, this, on his website. He says he's going to stop giving these tips when actually financial management is taught in schools. Do you know, otherwise you're going to keep, um, keep going at it. It's, it's so important that, that, that people learn about the stuff and they don't. So there's little psychological research about money, um, but lots of socioeconomic research about levels of debt. We know that since 2008, the richest 1,000 people, I mean, since the sort of credit crunch and all of that, the richest 1,000 people in the UK have doubled their income. You know, we know that. We know at the moment that, that um, something like a 30%, uh, the 30 poorest, the 30% poorest people in the UK have the same wealth as the richest 65 people. The richest 65, you know, and, and you know, these things are far more extreme in, in, in other countries. You know, we know there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, you know, we know money is tight. We know that most couples have to work these days if you've got children, because actually house prices and stuff mean that actually somebody can't stay at home. So it has an enormous impact, I think, on you know, childcare. We encourage our children to debt. Um, Michael Moore in the States is having a big sound off about what he calls the debtors' prisons of student loans, which in the States are massive, as you probably know. And you can come out of university in America with £80,000 worth of debt. You can come out in the UK with forty grand, can can't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but we're encouraging our children to invest in their future, to borrow money. And I think we should be a bit concerned about all of that. I, mean, I understand this in economic arguments, but I just wonder what that does. Because if you invest in your debt today, then is it, you know, it's, just, it's, it's just not too, too much further to invest in, in the car tomorrow, or the suit, or you know, just the idea of actually, I can, I can buy now and pay later. Or, I can buy now and work it out later, mm-hmm. which is what I'll tell you really uh, so much about compulsive debting is about. Because compulsive debting is about what we, we describe it as taking hopium. It's like, I'll spend this now and just hope for the best that we're working out later, you know. So, um, we know some of these things. We know about, uh, we know that um, money is implicated certainly in suicide. I mean, for men between the age of 20 and 50, suicide is the, is the first cause, of, you know, the main cause of death. You know, we know it peaks between 40 and 45. We know that actually it's more prevalent amongst low socioeconomic classes. We don't know the research. The Samaritans have just commissioned a brilliant study on suicide, actually. It was published this year, paid for by National Rail, for reasons that you might imagine, because people, <laughs> because people jump in front of trains. But with an aim, actually, reducing the amount of, of, of male suicide death, uh, 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 basically male suicide. Um, and what they're coming up with is that you know, it has so much to do, certainly for men, come on in, so much to do with sort of loss of role um, for men, and of course the inability to talk about it, you know, the, inab- the shame that goes with it, because men, unlike women, tend not to form sort of you know, groups and have mates that they might talk about this stuff, so there's a lot of shame, um, there's a lot of shame for men. And we know, and we hear about it, uh, don't we, on the news, about certainly people who might kill themselves and kill their families, which happens from time to time. And you, or we always hear, don't we? So there aren't proper statistics, but you know, very often we're hearing about d- levels of debt, aren't we? You know, that, that, that. So you know, we know that this is, this is a, a, a big thing. The psychological information about debting comes actually most, nearly, mostly from the 12 step recovery movement. You know, being, being reflective on itself. And, you know, I think the 12 step recovery movement has contributed so much in this area. And actually, in truth, it's contributed so much when it comes to all the process addictions that, um, that I'll talk about. And, um, you know, the trust debt movement now, particularly with Debtors Anonymous, which again ought to be really big, but isn't, under Earners Anonymous, which came out of Debtors Anonymous, I'll talk about that later. Workaholics Anonymous, actually, which also came out and started by people from um, Debtors Anonymous. 
But all of that comes out of the, uh, out of the AA movement. Um, the only book that I know of that really properly addresses uh, the psycho psychological aspects of debting and under earning are the, book, are the two books by a guy called Gerald with a J. Mundis, which some of you may know, who wrote a book, his first book. He's, he's a self um, identified member of, um, of Debtors Anonymous, and he wrote a book called um, How to Stay Out, How to Get Out of Debt, Stay Out of Debt, and Live Prosperously. It's a, one of the best self help books, actually. It's one that we give to, we, we give to, to most of our clients. A very good book. Um, and it was the first time that people started talking about actually the psychological processes here. He also contributed, so he, re he does, you know, he deserves, you know, deserves a mention. So Gerald with a, with a J, Mundis. Uh, he also wrote a book called um, Under Earning. And he's the guy that first coined the phrase, really, or identified under earning as maybe being something pathological. You know, people who would repeatedly not earn enough money to meet their needs, despite actually having the training and capabilities to do so. And I'll talk in more, in more detail about that. So big contribution really from him, big contribution from, um, uh, from AA. If you look back over the, the history of Alcoholics Anonymous and you read it with, with an eye on the, with, you know, one eye on financial addictions, it's also very interesting. Because actually the stories, I don't know how, much of you are how many of you are connected to the 12-step movement, but Bill Wilson, one of the founders of, of Alcoholics Anonymous, when you read his story or the story of, of Alcoholics Anonymous' development, it is full of um, financial issues. Bill Wilson, in his story, he moved house many times, downsizing, because he was giving money away and not looking after, not looking after himself. He had all the things that we think about um, in terms of compulsive debting in terms of poor saving habits. It was all there. He also talked a lot about grandiosity and entitlement. I think he wasn't able, I mean, actually when we look back, we can see a lot of process addictions in the history of Alcoholics Anonymous, and we certainly shouldn't knock it. Henry Kissinger said, didn't he, that AA was probably America's greatest contribution to the 20th century. You know, I think that's a big thing to say, and I think, I, I, I think it's right. Um, but it's there, and those of you that know um, the, the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous, which uh, have then been taken on by other, all the other 12-step fellowships, will know that three of them mention money, which is interesting. So one of them, Tradition 6, which is about not lending the AA name to an outside enterprise, not endorsing or lending any name, and it goes on to say, less problems of, of, of money, property, or prestige divert us from our primary purpose. So money is mentioned there as something that could get really dangerous. Tradition 7 talks about um, every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contribution. So again, some notion that actually people need to look after themselves. There is an account of a big dinner hosted by Rockefeller um, in, the mid, in the mid 20th century for Alcoholics Anonymous, at which the hope was, before the dinner, that actually a lot of money would be raised for Alcoholics Anonymous. By the end of the dinner, uh, Rockefeller's son, whose name completely escapes me, I think it might be Nelson, does that sound right? Nelson Rockefeller, had said, you know what, the only way this is going to work is if you do this on your own which I imagine was meant by shit, you know, <laughs> by a lot of them. But of course, it was a really important thing, fully self-supporting. So it's there. You know, the money stuff is all, it, it, is all there. Um, and we know, you know, the recovery movements contain massive amounts of healing wisdom. You know, they manage shame and anxiety. They're mood-altering uh, mood programs, and they focus rightly on, on personal responsibility, this notion that victims don't recover. Um, so... Having set that bit of the scene, um, I'm going to talk just a bit generally about what we know about addiction, um, with the aim really, because what you need to know about debting, there are two ways to get into debt, okay? One is by spending too much money, the other is by not earning enough money. So the, the spending too much is what we would call the compulsive spending. Some people might think of it as a subset of that of being compulsive shopping. Actually, we like to think of it, I like to think of it as compulsive wanting. Not spending or shopping or retail therapy. It's about compulsive wanting. Um, the other way is, is the under-earning, and I'll talk in more detail about that. Um, and, and I think that is just as compulsive. Um, but 
compulsive debting, you, you compulsively debt. I don't think people actually set out to, I say I want to get into debt. Compulsive debting is a consequence of compulsive wanting, high spending, um, and, um, and under earning. But actually, compulsive debting, th there, isn't, um, there isn't a psychiatric diagnosis for, it's not recognized as a disease, as, as actually m many of the process addictions aren't. The eating disorders tend to be. Um, the sex addictions are slightly. But um, I want to really illustrate to you how actually it's a no-brainer. That, um, that compulsive debting is a disease, and, and, and I certainly want to intend to do that. So what we know about addiction is it's genetically proposed and environmentally disposed. We see it's a pathological process. It begins with a search for pleasure, and it goes very quickly into an escape from reality. We know that it's self-serving, it's anti-intimacy, it's, anti -intimacy, it's fueled by shame and anxiety, and it becomes a primary relationship. So actually addiction becomes the most important thing. We know that. We know, as I said before, that people face many addictions in the course of recovery, and we see people with what you might call very mature recoveries in Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous who've worked really hard who suddenly find that uh, realise actually that there's other stuff going on. That is, we know that addictions can mask, you know, you know, they can mask things, the cocaine addiction that masks some of the sexual behaviour. Is that, what's that sort of 20 minutes? Thanks very much. Um, which is about sort of just under halfway. Any of you getting desperate? Um, so we know that addictions can really mask. You know, if, if you're a heroin addict, you're going to be spending shed loads of money, and you're not really going to be thinking about it because you're going to be thinking that actually, you know, heroin costs money. You know, if um, if you do if you know if if you're doing the cocaine and you're a sex addict, you may well just focus so much on the cocaine and, and, and miss out on the link between that. If you're an alcohol dependent, you know that it, alcohol has an enormous impact on impulse control and. and Actually, that can mask the fact that people are, are, spending, are spending lots and lots of money. We know that some of the specific drugs, some of the, you know, the amphetamine use, for example, can mask eating, eating disorders. You know, so we have people into treatment who are amphetamine users, but actually, what uh, in actual fact, what they're suffering from is like alcohol and drugs. You know, the process addictions that we call we call them. So, the food addictions of anorexia, bulimia, orthorexia. Do you know about orthorexia? Mm -hmm. Orthorexia is fascinating. It's the biggest eating disorder. It's, it's the unhealthy obsession with healthy eating. You know, it's the fact that you know I've got to it. To some extent, although some people do need to do this, it's about the weighing, the measuring. It's like I've got to have organic. It's got to come from here. It's you know, it gets more, more and more. This unhealthy obsession with healthy eating, and this is a, a big obsession again gets really confused. People spend, and we see that with the financial addictions. People spend a fortune sourcing very, very expensive stuff which they absolutely can't afford because, you know, and then they don't go to the dentist or they can't pay the bills because somehow I've got to have, you know, it's about ortho's Greek for right, you know, right eating. Mm. Um, but the thing about the process addictions is they're complicated, aren't they? Because actually they all involve things that we need to do, the sex and love addictions. You know, we procreate, we seek proximity. You know, it's not like you can't just give it up. It's the same as spending money and it's the same we need to, we need to eat. So this is a whole, you know, it's a real complication. So I'm going to tell you about um, how we classify um, addictions. And the American Psychiatric Association uses a manual called the, the DSM. It stands for the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. The um, World Health Organization has a, a little booklet called the ICD, which is the International Classification of Diseases. Now, in this book, you open it up, and basically you, meet, you can read all these symptoms, and if you meet the certain criteria, you diagnose an illness. Do you know, that's how it works. Now, substance misuse, or, or substance dependence, actually, because there are two categories, but substance dependence, I want to just tell you the criteria for substance dependence, and then we'll think of it in terms of, of, of actually debting. Okay? So substance dependence requires a certain criteria to be met. Firstly, there's a preoccupation. I can't stop thinking about the heroin. I've got to get stoned. I can't stop thinking about drinking. I don't get the weekends off. I wake up thinking about it, and I can't. And I go to sleep thinking about it. It's there, the preoccupation. Um, another criteria is the loss of control. Once I start, I can't stop. I only meant to have one drink, and gosh, uh, you know, I can't even remember what happened, but I came back three days later. Do you know, it's the once I start, I can't, st I can't stop. 
It's the tolerance. I need to drink more to get the same effect. I need to take more of this drug to get the same effect. You know, what used to be um, 10 milligrams of diazepam, you know what, two weeks later it's 20, and that's not enough. Do you know? So there's a whole notion of tolerance. We look for, there's another criteria, which is the unsuccessful attempts to control. I'm definitely not going to do it again. I'm going to throw it all away. I'm going to get all the names of my dealers out of my dress book. I'm not going to hang out with the, I'm going to change my playpen and my playmates. I'm not going to that pub anymore. And then, of course, it happens again. So the unsuccessful attempts to stop. Another criteria is an impact on, on, on functioning. So maybe perhaps legal issues, relationship issues, family issues, health issues. So we might think of that, so we think about um, heroin addiction, we think about the risks of sharing needles, hepatitis C, we think about alcohol addiction, we think about sclerosis of the liver, wet brain, all that sort of thing physically, as well as all sorts of water retention and other difficulties that people get into. Um, and cholesterol, which is a big focus at the moment. Um, and the, other, uh, the next criteria is um, continued use, despite the fact that actually it's not in our best interest to do so. So there's a whole bunch of studies. So, you know, I know this isn't good for me. I know it doesn't make any sense. I know if I do this, I'm get, uh, you know, such and such is going to happen. But I'm going to do it anyway, okay? Now, I've mentioned a whole lot of criteria. You know what? You only need two of those to diagnose substance dependence, okay? So let's just think of that in terms of, some, uh, of debting, a preoccupation. The people that we see, and actually, in pri I work in private practice now, Although we, we charity to give away, uh, 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 not very much, I'm afraid, each of us half a day of our time, um, at, at, at a very low cost. Typically, you don't see people with financial addictions in private practice because it's the last thing they're going to have any money to, to, you know, to spend on. And I think that's such a pity. And there's, there's a real need, actually, to, to rethink that and really help people. Well, certainly for citizens' advice bureaus and credit counselling to really think about the psychological um, that component here with people who don't you know, donate their time because you can't, it's, it's just, it's a, you can't do it, you can't charge money really because people won't, they just won't turn up, which is just, it seems awful. But think about the preoccupation. You know, if you have financial addictions, the people that we see, they wake up thinking about money. Oh God, I owe this money, I can't really do it, how am I going to do it, how am I going to get out of this? They're scheming about, oh, maybe if I do this and that'll be okay, if I work really hard or if I promise or I cut down on this this month, this and, there's an enormous preoccupation. No weekends off, no bank holidays, it's there all the time. There's a loss of control, you know, I'll just spend a little bit, I'll go, I'm going to go out and buy this, and actually they come back, they go to Boots for the toothbrush and they come back to the whole store, do you know? There's a loss of control, there's a tolerance. There's a sense of actually, well, okay, my credit card is 2,000 pounds, that's a bit much. A couple of years later, 5,000, I think that's okay. You know, 10,000 and the loans, that's, that's all right, I can manage that. You know, we, we, people develop this tolerance. Um, unsuccessful attempts to control, I'm going to cut up all my credit cards, I'm going to get one, I'm going to consolidate the debt, it's all going to go into one thing, and what tends to happen, people consolidate and then and bring up the credit cards and the loans and everything comes back again. And people end up with more, uh, we have clients who've got more credit cards than actually fit in the pockets in their wallet. Do you know? Um, and it's all, and it becomes part of the preoccupation, moving money around, paying for, you know, paying for this debt by creating another debt. Um, but the impact on functioning, well, as we said before, people kill themselves over this stuff. You know, there's a lot of shame. It can't be talked about. The impact on relationships, the secrecy is really there. Although I would argue um, that in the couple relationship where there is a financial addictions, Actually, there are, as there are with all addictions, there are two sets of financial addictions. Because for one, for him or her to act out financially, the other has to actually turn a blind eye in some way. Do you know? And we always say this. We say this in couples counselling when someone comes along and says, God, look, she's just doing this, and she spends this with the credit card, and this and that, or she's complaining about him. And at some point, you have to say, well, at what point did you actually decide that you were going give, to give the other all this control over your joint money? You know? Because for that to happen, there has to be a bit of a collusion. Now, I have to tell you, the party who thinks, 
couples counselling, very often, one party brings the other for what we call realignment. That's very often what tends to happen. You never bring her along because somebody needs to have a good talk to her and we'll sort her out, or, you know, let's talk to him. And, it, and it, of course, it's not like that, and it's quite difficult when you start saying to people, look, actually, I think money's an issue for both of you. You've got into a muddle, and this is an issue that's been held for, for both of you. But it's there. Um, and continued use, despite knowledge that it's harmful, continuing to spend without control, despite knowledge that actually there are unopened letters, there are people ringing up and um, wanting their money, you know, it's really stressful. So I think, I, 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 you know, it's a no-brainer, isn't it? You know, this has all the hallmarks of, uh, of addictive disease. You know, the criteria for substance dependence, is, it, you know, it, it's the same criteria that can be used for, for compulsive debting. Now, I've said that there are two ways to get into debt. Compulsive spending, which, I, I, which again, as I said, is more about compulsive wanting um, and under-earning. So compulsive spending or wanting is um, it's about, it's about <coughs> lack of impulse control. It's about spending on a whim. It's, an in, it's about an inability to say no. It's about an inability to delay gratification. It's a sort of work it out later. It's the hopium thing that I'm talking about. Let's spend now. Let's work it out, out later. Compulsive spenders who aren't in debt are people who just haven't run out of money yet. Okay? Compulsive spenders who aren't in debt are people who also may not have run out of enablers or people who bail them out. Because mm -hmm. compulsive spending, if you continue to do it, is a no-brainer that you end up in, de in, in debt. Um, Under-earning is repeatedly bringing in less money than you need despite efforts and desires to do otherwise. It's not about being lazy. Actually, under-earners tend to be very smart people. They tend to be very good at working for others and helping other people increase their fortunes. <coughs> they really do, but actually find it very hard to do it for themselves. It's about working below one's capability. I've seen, I've had clients who've been considering doing their third PhD rather than get a job. Okay, because it's somehow I've got to put this stuff off. You know, and of course it all makes so much sense because if I have this skill, then when I've got it, I could do this. But you know what? We know that when you've got it, it won't be enough and there'll be something else that they need to do. Okay? So it, it's, um, you know, it involves quite a bit of mental gymnastics, this stuff. Um, so working below is one's capacity. Um, it's also about saying no to money. It's about turning your back on money. People who are self-employed, the under-earners who are self-employed, it, what it looks like is often living amongst clutter, being an organised person but having quite a lot of personal clutter, that we see a lot of that, okay? So a lot of personal clutter, keep everyone else's life very organised, but actually we can't find everything and I'm cleaning the office for 10 years, you know, <coughs> <coughs> that sort of stuff. Um, it's about not charging appropriate fees, it's about invoicing late, just not sending them out, it's about not chasing up um, it, um, debtors to the people that owe you money. It's about not you know. It's about not charging appropriately. It's about not following up inquiries, opportunities. You know, work comes in and actually, and instead of just yeah, let's get on the phone. Thanks for calling. What can we do? Let's have a meeting. That stuff doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, lots of people do that. But what I want, the, the point about under earning um, is is that actually this is something that people repeatedly do. You know, you sort of know. That if you weren't, if you didn't have an addictive process, you would know that actually, if you don't follow something up, <coughs> or put it this way, if you don't send an invoice, you're not going to get paid. You know, so you might do it once and be a bit late and be, oh God, bloody hell, I've got to wait three months. You know, I need this money now, and it's my fault. If you're an under earner, actually, that's something that happens repeatedly. You know, so these two ways to get into debt: compulsive spending or wanting, and under earning. And um, uh, the other thing about under is that most people actually have an idea, probably once a day, about something they could do to increase their income or to be happier and more successful. You know, most people, my experience of people in recovery is then, actually when we have done, uh, you know, done psychometrics and IQ tests, we know people in recovery actually weigh above average. Uh, you know, but actually, I say in recovery, people are often from primary addictions who then are, are struggling with, um, with, um, with, with under-earning. They tend to have all sorts of ideas. Oh, I could do this or that, and I've got this talent. But you know what? It's, oh, well, no, I haven't got the time. You know, the rationalizations are really there. You know, I haven't got the time, I haven't got the time to do it. Maybe another time. Um, 
I, I, I had the same thing, because I, I did this talk, um, because I, I'm, I'm, quite, I'm very interested in early psychological wins, so I did this talk on, ad on adoption and addiction and how adoptees are overrepresented. And um, the one that was filmed here, that was put on YouTube, has got 10,000 hits, and there are people around the world. I get an email about every two weeks from somebody saying, have you got any more information, have you written a book? Now, they've been saying that for about three years. Have I written my book? <laughs> <laughs> However, am I writing my book? Yes. So I'd like to think I'm slightly in recovery. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but I, I said as an illustration, you know what I mean. You know, it's so easy. And addiction's like that, isn't it? it it's this, this ability to act against our best interests. It's very, very powerful. Now, actually, to underwear and compulsively spend, you have to have some core beliefs and you have to have some quite delusional thinking to keep it all in place. Okay? I mean, the delusional thinking is often around, um, well, actually, this is what men do, and they spend money, and this is what they do, this is what women do, or, you know, I'm waiting for my big break, you know, when this piece of work, when this thing, particularly for the creators, when I've done this, everything will be okay, I'm just waiting to be discovered, um, people delude themselves, I'm helping others, you know, like, actually, I'm doing it, but actually, it's a bit like on the aeroplane, you put on your own oxygen mask before you put on that help anyone else, don't you? Do you know, so you see a lot of people who think that they've got a big heart, but actually, you know what, they're debting it, they're really debting. Because if we deprive ourselves to give to somebody, that's not keeping what you have by giving it away. It's, having, it, it's about never having it in the first place. Um, so there's quite a lot of delusional thinking, but there's some core cool beliefs that are, are, are behind this stuff in comparison to debting. One of the core cool beliefs is that if I have enough money, all will be well. You know, if only there was enough money, everything will be all right. Um, and that's quite persuasive for people. If only there was enough, everything would be okay. But what we know about addiction is there's never enough. There is never enough. The other one is, I can't, and the other core cool belief, big for people, the sex and, and love addicts particularly, and the codependents, I cannot manage on my own. I can only survive and if I'm looked after. There's going to need to be a windfall, an inheritance, a lottery win, a sugar daddy, a rich woman, do you know, I can't actually manage on my own. It's a core belief. Now, the thing about these core beliefs is they're what um, the psychologist Bolas called unthought knowns. They are, if you like, they are something that we know, but we don't think about the fact that we know them. They're held in a part of the brain which is part of the limbic brain, okay? So they're not, if you think about... Um, it, 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 the brain is divided into three parts. The bit that does the most logical stuff is here, is the, is the cortex. Behind that, much deeper, is the limbic brain, which is online and active much before, uh, uh, earlier than the, than the cortex. And these unthought knowns are held in the limbic brain. So actually, we tend, we sort of, if we stop and think, we sort of know them, but we, if we're not thinking it all the time. They're just there, like an operating system on the computer, just driving it all. I only have enough money, everything will be okay, or I'll only really manage in this world and find my feet if somebody looks after me, or if there's a windfall or a miracle, or a lottery win or an inheritance of some kind. Now, there's another core cool belief which we, were, we talk about as being a visibility, a visibility issue. Because for a lot of people, the idea of being successful, they are ambivalent about success. They really want to be successful and yet really don't. And there's an enormous conflict. It's particularly true for people with, again, with quite early wounds. If you've been bullied, if you've been sexually abused, there will be something stored in your limbic brain about, if I stand out, I'm going to be in trouble. And yet also there's going to be a feeling of, actually... I've got some talent, I want to make something happen. And what's more, it would be nice to stand out and I might be in control, I'd earn more money, I might be famous, these things would happen. So what you've got is an ambivalence. You've got a conflict between this, this fear of being visible and standing out and this desire and capability to actually be successful. And again, these issues tend to be held, again, at this very limbic level, these unthought knowns. Because, you know, to get in, to be a compulsive debtor, to be a compulsive spender, actually, you know, there has to be something going on much deeper than that. We know it's a disease. We know, we think about alcohol and drug addiction. We know that actually we think about them as a disease, but we also know there's a dis-ease behind the disease. There are two, when you treat addiction, there are two diseases. There's the complete loss of control with the substance of the process, but there's also the disease, which I guess a lot of the time now we're thinking of and calling codependency, which is behind and holding up 
these addictive um, processes. So this is th these core beliefs, and I think this is really important. I think the visibility one is really important. Really, particularly, we see the people who identify themselves as under earners. There tends to be a real issue about, a real conflict about standing out. And it's quite painful to see people who are very, who have the potential to be really successful, who can't quite allow themselves to do it. What it means is that when they do do something, they tend to procrastinate, leave it till the last moment, and maybe do half the job that they're capable of doing. So it's a, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, that, that I'm going to do. Do you follow that? Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I think it's a really important point. Um, we also all have money scripts. We have things that we've learned from our, um, we have things that we've learned from our parents about what money means. Mm -hmm. Do you know? We just do, it. and it's a very important. Those of you that are therapists, really important. Not only when to ask them how much money they earn and what debt they have and about the relationship with money, but also what were mum and dad or what were the caregivers like with money? You know, what were they like? Was it? Did they act like it, it was just plenty? You know. Was it already tight like it was, there was going to be none tomorrow? What was it like? Because the chances are that what we tend to do as children, we either internalise exactly what a parent is doing, or we internalise the opposite. It's a bit like, you know, my dad used to smack me around, you know, clip me around the ear. I'm not going to do, you know, I'm not going to do anything like that with my children. You know, I'm just, it's just going to be all hugs and, and yes to everything. But what we know is 180 degrees from dysfunctional is still dysfunctional. It's not resolved. And it's an important point. So, um, you know, money scripts are really quite important for people to think about. What have I learned? What have I learned about money? Um, I mentioned addiction interaction. How are we doing with the time? Mm, about 40, 40 minutes at the moment. Okay. Should we go? You're right. Am mm -hmm. I making sense? You've still got yeah. an hour and 20 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's a bit much, isn't it? <laughs> they do that this week. Seven till nine. I am it's capable right. of talking for a long time. Because um, I often say this, I don't know if you know, but actually, if you're in a state of, uh, uh, of trauma or you're adrenalized, the part of the brain that mediates tongue closes down. Do you know that experience? So that actually, I'm capable of still being talking two hours later and thinking, I've only just started. <laughs> and you're all looking at your watch, just trying to find some polite way to, to get out, because you just lose track of time. It's a very interesting thing that happens, actually. Um, when you're generalised and in trauma. Mainly because, you know, it's not needed, let's face it. When a man eating tiger comes into the room, we don't have to worry about, you know, dinner in 20 minutes. It's like, look, let's get out, you know, let's get out of here. Anyway, but I'm only going to talk for about 50 minutes, I think, or something like that. And we'll have some, some questions. So let's, I mean, I hope it's making some, se uh, some, some mm -hmm. sense to you. Um, I, I really do, because I'm so glad. I, I mean, it's just great that you're here, but it's the smallest audience I talk to, and I just, you know what, I'm not going to take it personally. <laughs> <laughs> really not. <laughs> Particularly when this poor chap at UCASAT the other week who had four of us in the room. God. I mean, he just, he's, he'd spent ages on this presentation. It was nothing like this. You know, he had the whole, you know, the whole caboodle and the slides, and we even had a bit of video clips, you know, it's just like, God, it's really sad. Because it's got to be thought about this. Because it's a major problem, particularly as we are teaching our children to debt with the student loans. Mm -hmm. It's really, really important that, that we get our heads around this stuff. So um, I'm going to let, let's I'll just go over the indications, really, of compulsive debt and spending and under earning. I'm going to talk a bit about recovery, because let's face it, that's really important, isn't it? And to be like one of these self-help books where you get to the end and you completely understand the problem and you still can't work out what you're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think you certainly don't need any of that. Um, so, in a way, compulsive debt, it's a progressive illness. It's a progressive illness like any other. You know, it begin, you know, begins with some sort of behaviours that are sort of okay that people might do, a bit like alcoholism, have a drink when they get home from work, just have a drink, a bit of relief drinking, you know, that becomes sort of habitual and, and out of control and doing that because as it goes, it goes down. So, you know, the sort of things that we're looking for, we're seeing in the progression of, of, of this disease. Is we're, we're, first of all, we're looking at people who are living sort of quite hand to mouth, paycheck to paycheck. People who actually there isn't a, there isn't enough month left at the end of the paycheck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just like it's always getting used up. We're looking for people who have poor or no saving habits because compulsive debtors and spenders, it's all about now. So the fact that actually once a year I have to pay my car insurance, there isn't like well let's divide the year by twelve and think about how much I have to put aside. You know, the notion of accruing or saving is just like. I, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. You know, for, for a lot of these people, there's a lack of clarity. 
There's a vagueness around money, a vagueness about interest rates, about what's owed, a vagueness about you know, how much money do I earn, what do the utilities actually cost, what, does it, what, do, what do we need to live, a lack of clarity. The word, we look out for the word roughly. When somebody says, oh, roughly, you think, roughly is a four-letter word. In fun- <laughs> <laughs> roughly is a four-letter word when it comes to financial addictions. Mm-hmm. This is all about clarity. The serenity is in the clarity. Without clarity, mm-hmm. there is anxiety. That's the truth of it. But it's hard to face. It's hard to face. We're looking at um, indications, comfort spending, so the retail therapy, making ourselves feel better. I think it's interesting that mummy and money are so similar, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> mummy? I don't know what the roots are of all that, but I just I think that's fascinating. Because I think there's so much about comfort in spending. And there's lots of other stuff about, you know, if you buy stuff and maybe you get some attention from people who are selling it. You know, the more you spend, the more they'll tell you you look good and what you just bought. Mm-hmm. So now you believe them and forget the commission. Do you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's the, the comfort spend. They can't pass up a good deal. It's leaving price tags on things and, you know, not returning them. It's buying things that don't get used. You know, there's a lot of people, you know, it, 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 with, with these sorts of issues who've got stuff that just haven't, got wardrobes full of stuff that they really thought they needed, but um, it doesn't get used. Um, we often notice uh, an avoidance of conversations about money and debt. It just feels a bit uncomfortable um, to happen. There's a fantasy of being rescued, of having a windfall when I get my break, if only, and you know, working out the odds of winning the lottery. There's often overwork, and that's an addiction interaction, just working really hard to try and manage. But actually, when people, when compulsive debt is overwork, they tend to not actually be that focused in terms of what they're doing. And they find that, and this is the interaction with work addiction, because work addiction, as you know, isn't about working. You know, work addiction is about busyness. Work addiction is about managing anxiety by keeping busy and focused Mm -hmm. on a project. Mm -hmm. Believing that when that project is done, all will be well. But actually what happens when that project is finished? You need another one. You know, it's about an inability to relax and be with being with self. It's about uh, it's about adrenaline. Um, so often, the working that happens for these people is really just actually it keeps the anxiety at bay rather than actually earns the money. And it's certainly not creative because the preoccupation that goes with compulsive debting means actually creativity gets knocked on the head. You know, all the good thoughts you just they don't get they don't get managed and processed. Um, we see increased use of credit cards to solve problems, you know, we'll work it out later. Um, entitlement, late payments, starting to miss payments, not opening envelopes, you know, with bills, anything brown, don't open it, they pile, you know, they pile up. Somehow, if, you know, if, it's, if you don't look at it, it doesn't affect you, but, you know, we know about that. We start to see um, sort of physical and psychological ill health in terms of depression, high levels of anxiety, preoccupation, distraction a lot, that always whenever people are with somebody they just can't quite think straight because actually um, you know, they're, they're thinking about they're preoccupied with the money. Other addictions of course tend to take off. We often see binge and purge. People are like, I won't spend, I won't spend, I won't spend, I won't spend. Ah! Blows the whole lot. You know, like a coiled spring. Um, bankruptcies of course. For compulsive debtors, bankruptcies are not a solution. Uh, because actually there's no sense of responsibility and a lot of compulsive debtors actually are recidivists. You know, they get back up again. Um, so it's a vicious cycle. And, you know, and it goes just down and down and down until we get to this cycle of debting, anxiety, shame, and just yeah, some, some craziness and some, uh, some real desperation. So let's talk about recovery. Let's talk about recovery. The goal of, excuse me, of compulsive debting or the, the compulsive wanting or under-earning is not getting rich and it's not getting out of debt. And a lot of people come into recovery programs thinking, if only I get rid of my debt, everything will be okay. I have seen people, I saw somebody get rid of £100,000 of unsecured debt. And by the way, there is a difference in debt. Secured debt is fine because actually you're borrowing money against something you already own. And if you can't pay it back, somebody comes and takes your house away. Mm-hmm. The problem with compulsive debting is unsecured debt. Okay. It's not your money, you're borrowing someone else's and you put nothing up as it is, it's, it's collateral. But I've seen people focus on getting rid of this person, got, got £100,000 worth of debt, and you know what happened? It just happened again. In a movement, brought, uh, incurred £30,000 worth of debt. It's almost as if because they weren't addressing the underlying issues, the anxiety, all the anxiety is managed, if you like, it's hung on the hook of 
gosh, if only I get out of debt, everything will be okay. You get out of debt, but the anxiety, the general anxiety disorder that's so often there behind the addictions, suddenly is there, and it's like, oh, I've got to do something else with it. So it either can go into another addiction, or it goes back into, let's create some more debt. And actually, we know that with the process addictions, there are three things that get craved, actually, for people in recovery from process addictions. Because actually, everybody in recovery is on a spectrum of many of all the addictions. That's the truth. <coughs> it's like a fingerprint. Everyone has a slightly different fingerprint. Now, some people think, oh, I haven't really got any food problems. But you know what? You're probably sugar sensitive. Somebody might say, well, I haven't really got any financial problems. You know what? There will be something there. But it's just like, you know, it's like a fingerprint. It's an, it's an, a, an individual thing. I've completely forgotten what point I was going to make, actually. Three things crowed. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. That's the good thing about a small audience. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What was it? <laughs> Say it again. Three things. You were saying the three things crowed. Yes, you're crowed. Okay. Thank you very I much. I it very interesting. Okay. <laughs> Sugar, spending, and romance, which actually is sex. Okay? These are the things that get craved in different amounts, primarily particularly for people who are recovering from, from drug and alcohol addictions, who actually often don't experience a craving for alcohol and drugs. The cravings go into these three areas, and they're the ones to watch. You know, at times of, times of stress. I was walking along here from the tube, and I suddenly thought, I was just looking in a few short windows, you know. I was looking in a few short windows and thinking, maybe I think I need one of those Timberland, and pairs of those Timberland shoes, because one of our puppies is going to eat my other ones. And, do you know, and then think, wait a minute, what's this about? There's a bit of anxiety. You know, it's there. Mm -hmm. Now, actually, spending and buying things appropriately is absolutely fine, but that's t what tends to happen for people in recovery. In, and those are things to look out for. You know, the, the, the sugars, the spending, and the, and the desire for romance, or perhaps sex. Um, so, the goal is not to get out of debt, and it's not to get rich. Although, you know what? I see that happening for people. But if you make that the primary purpose, it won't happen. The goal of, and in fact, this is the same with all the processes of addiction, <coughs> the goal is self-care and peace of mind. It's the ability to look after ourselves and to find some peace of mind. Um, and it's a really, really important point, because people think, people come into uh, uh, try and work on their, set, their love addiction, and somewhere they think the goal is to have a really nice, loving relationship. If you make that your goal, that's not going to happen. It's putting the cart in front of the horse. It's about being able to take care of yourself and have peace of mind. These other things will follow. Okay. So we know that people, in, in, in order to recover, there are several things that people need to do. So firstly, they need to admit they have a problem. It's a very difficult thing, particularly for people who are already in a recovery movement, to say, gosh, you know what, I think I'm an addict in another area. I see a lot of people, so I'm just going to say, for those of you that understand the 12-step movement, um, I see a lot of people coming along who so want to believe that their financial addictions are what they might call in their AA program or their NA program a step six and seven issue. You know, that somehow this is a little character defect. Mm -hmm. It's really, really important that this is seen as, you know, as this is a back to a step one issue. It's about, I need to admit that I've lost control of this, that this is a problem. And that's hard and it's shameful. You know, because we don't talk about them, we don't talk about money, we don't make it okay. Um, and, and of course, this is where the fellowships are, 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 so, are so useful, the idea of having... Because admit, if you admit something, you let it in, don't you? But in order to let it in, to let that truth in, you tend to need another person. It's a, relation, a relational thing, the idea of admitting. So it's so important to have other people around you. So if, if people are recovering, if you don't belong to some 12-step fellowship, there are other ways to do this, but you're certainly going to need a team. You know, we get ill in relationships, we get well in relationships. You can't do it, it doesn't happen on its own. Um, very obviously, um, you, you, know, you don't get out of debt by debting in the same way you don't put out a fire with fire. You have to stop debting one day at a time. Now that can be very difficult. People say, oh, well, I've got to, I'm going to have to do this, or what about this, or that, or the other. But we often say to people, well, you know, if you were an alcoholic, is there some circumstance in which you think it would be okay to have a drink? You know? So actually, if you suffer from the financial addictions, very honestly, is there a circumstance where you can really justify having one? Because if you have one, what we know about addiction is once you start, we don't know when you're going to stop. Mm. You know, it's very difficult for people to get, to, to get their heads around that. Um, we encourage people to use cash at first, because you know what? An awful lot of compulsive spenders, somebody says, uh, check the amount and put in your PIN card. 
They do that. They don't even look at the amount on the screen. Do you know? It's just like, oh, just do it. You know, put in the pin number. We'll just do it. Um, so we encourage people to, 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 to use cash and then debit cards, but not credit cards. Um, we encourage people to keep records. Now, if you're a spender, you're going to keep a record of your, uh, of your money. You're going to keep a record of what you've spent. And people say, God, do I really have to do that? And do I have to count the pence, you know, and the coffee if it was £2.62? Do you know, do I have to do that? And the answer is yes. We want clarity, we want real detail. The under earners, what's really important is to keep a track of time. Because actually, people who under earn are very good at keeping busy doing the wrong things. Or indeed, just losing hours, you know, surfing the net. Although actually, that, the fantasy and intrigue for the spenders is quite big. We used to think that fantasy and intrigue was something only that the sex and love addicts did. Do you know that they would just be dreaming of some perfect relationship or getting involved in something intriguing? But actually, we know with the debtors, there's a lot of fan uh, uh, fantasy and intrigue. They're, walk they're cruising along, they're looking at the smart cars, they're looking on the net, they're thinking, if I just had this for my living room, everything would be okay. You know, which actually really takes up a lot of time. And we really want to encourage people to bottom line that, to stop themselves going into fantasy. You can't help, um, you can't help the first frame so if you take the analogy with like sex and love addiction, if you spot, if you're walking down the street and somebody is drop dead gorgeous to you, you actually can't help the first notice, the first frame. What you can stop is the movie, which then goes on, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's the same. You can't stop noticing noticing the I don't know the Audi S5. You can't stop noticing the window or whatever. But actually, the responsibility is to not go into the movie. So to, you know, to bottom line the fantasy and intrigue, which once you tell people about that and they start to, they catch themselves doing it. You know, it's, oh, okay, I know what I'm doing. So you're bringing this stuff into consciousness. Um, we're keeping records, so the time records, the money records are about people recording their income, recording their spending, uh, recording their savings, and recording their um, debts. It's, and, and seeing it as a spiritual process. People who have a spiritual belief, you know, if there's a time that they do a daily reading, if they do a meditation or they say some prayers, we encourage people to do their numbers, to do their record keeping at that time. You know, don't think of this as not spiritual. You know, if you're a spiritual person, chances are God wants you to be sovereign. Do you know? It's a good time. It's a good time to do. Okay? Um, and do it on a daily basis, and it doesn't take any, any time at all. Uh, we encourage people to get spending plans and start to plan what they spend. The word budget is a complete is not in the recovery um, debtors dictionary. Budget is about constriction, and constriction leads to binge. Okay, spending plans. We encourage people to think about how much money they are planning to spend. Okay, really important, and that becomes an, an, an enjoyable thing. And they're doing it actually having really thought about it rather than mm. it just being impulsive. There are different ideas. We talk to people about outreaching about money, making phone calls, maybe having a 72-hour rule on something that they really feel that must-have sofa that you've seen in the sale. Give it 72 hours. See if you still feel the same. Tell someone else what you're planning to do. Chances are, if you don't want to tell anyone, it's probably not a good idea. Which is true of anything in addiction. <laughs> yeah, let, let's face it. If it's like, I'm going to keep this to myself, chances are you're an active addiction. <laughs> Um, the visions, really important for people, because actually people who suffer from addictions are so focused on the now, it's so preoccupying, they're not thinking about what they want to do. We're talking about an enormously talented group of people, you know, who need to start to have some visions. Now, if you, can't, if you have a vision about where, what you, where you want to go and you're not solvent, you know what they say, it's an, it's an hallucination. Mm -hmm. But actually, if you have a vision and you're solvent, you can manage your money, these things start to be possible. You know, and you see people do all sorts of stuff in terms of their self-care. So people say, I always wanted to play the piano, or I wanted to ride, or I wanted to do this, that, the other, I wanted to learn another language. Actually, people find they're, start, they're starting to be able to do that because they have a vision, there's a plan for it, there's a solvency, and that is part of the self-care development that we're looking for. And if that focus is there with the self-care, the debt um, and, and the earning, those things all change um, um, for people, so we see. Um, Action plans, so you're very important. Having buddies or co getting some coaching. Um, I think therapy, uh, I would say this, wouldn't I? But I think therapy is a useful thing here, but it in no way replaces actually self-help and getting help from other people. I like to think that addiction therapists are people who are teaching people not to need therapists, mm -hmm. you know, 
uh, because you know there's an awful lot of dependence that can um, can go on, and I think I was alluding that. Okay. Um, but certainly, you know, I think I mean the point of the therapy, the probably the best purpose in the therapy is to identify the core beliefs I was talking about. So if people have got issues around visibility and success, to really help people understand that stuff. You know, what is it that stops me, that makes me so capable and so want it, and yet so turn my back on it? Um, so I think identifying that, and then some of the therapies that work on the limbic system rather than the frontal cortex, because a lot of these core beliefs are not things that respond to CBT, to cognitive behavioral mm -hmm. therapy, because CBT works on a different part of the brain. CBT is good for many things in addiction, but not for these core beliefs. So you want to have some therapies that actually work on the limbic system. The sort of things people are doing, like, like EMDR, which you might have heard about, eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. It's a big mouthful, um, but um, it, 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 it's a technique for turning down the volume on some of these core beliefs. Um, equine therapy is a big one. Um, we did that down in, 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 in Dorset. That always, people always think it's a bit silly using horses, but horses are all limbic and actually have an enormous impact on what if you work with people, if you're working with the horses and turning down the volume on the, on the human limbic system. Uh, I could talk for ages about that. How does it work? I'll have a go. I might do it later. And ask me that question later. We'll need to get through. Get through. Otherwise, we will be here. There's no clock in here for me at all. Um, yeah, so therapy and also to clarify family scripts is really important. And then, you know, if these if people can do this, if people can say, look, you know what, I've got a problem, and there's no shame in this, I just sort of have. I'm an addict in other areas. It's you know, I'm just this is gonna happen. There's no way it couldn't happen. If we can just be a bit kinder, you know, or, you know, on ourselves and on others who talk about these things, you know, if we can find some compassion. I think people can make some enormous changes, particularly here and around the money. I see the biggest changes in circumstance and, um, and psychological functioning in this area around the financial addictions. I really see so much has changed so fast, but I also see a lot of people give up before the miracle happens because it really requires. Because the trouble is, you see, if you get, if you come along, if you go, to, you come along with an alcohol or drug problem, you stop, you stop using your alcohol and your drugs, and actually that's gone. Mm. You come along with a debt problem, actually that can be around for years and years. Mm. You know, you're really sort of managing it. There isn't a quick fix, and let's face it, people in recovery aren't that keen on things that don't have a quick fix. <laughs> so, you know, it takes a lot of people, lead. so in Debt is Anonymous, a lot of people come in and go out before the miracle happens. You know, which is a real pity, and then often come back later in, in, ter in terrible situations. But you know what, if people can do this, there's a real end to despair, and there will be an ability to delay gratification. So, and, and, for, and with that will come an ability to take care of oneself and to find peace of mind. You know, with clarity there will be confidence. You know, the serenity is in the clarity. People will live within their means, and they also, this is a DA phrase, their means will not define them. Because for a lot of people, what I have and what I own and what I've got somehow defines me. You know, without my Land Rover discovery, people will think that I'm no one. Actually, people will think I'm a twat for not careful. <laughs> Do you know? But the, you know, it, it's amazing the things we tell ourselves. I need to have this to look such and such, and actually, the evidence is that people don't see us as such and such, despite all of that. So, live within the means. Means will not define. I think also ceasing to compare because there's a lot of there's a lot of deprivation mentality in, in compulsive dating, where people are comparing. There's a feeling. If you've got something, you've got my share. You know, rather than actually, it might be an abundant universe. You know, there's only one cake, you've got a slice, but you've got mine. Do you know? <laughs> so that sort of stuff goes, and that becomes a real preoccupation. Um, and then an ability to sort of to value oneself and value one's contribution, which I think is really important. To start doing the things that people have always wanted to do, to learn the piano, to ride a horse, to learn a language, to stop, you know, to plan to stop working, to write a book. You know, and, and it's just, it's so moving to see these things happen. The saddest part of it for me is that most of the people who suffer like that, we don't get to see in our consulting rooms, and we don't get to give them this information, because addiction psychotherapists, I think, are different to general psychotherapists. Those of you that are therapists will know this, because in addiction, actually, you're a coach, you're often a bit of a policeman, you're an educator, you know, you're also an interpreter. You know, there is an. It's very different from you know from psychotherapy. There's a lot of lot of roles. Um, 
But these things all these things cost money, and I think it's a, it's such a pity. We've got to find a way. If there are two things that I would like to change, I would like to really look at the student debt situation that we're setting our kids up for. I'm not sure what the solution is, but it concerns me. And the other is that I would really like you guys to go from here if you didn't know this already, and and hold this information in mind and, and pass it on. That you know the biggest problem with money is not recession; it's our attitude. You know. To money. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Thank you so much for being here. I really, it's very nice. I, I enjoy doing this every year. So. Thank you. Thank you.